All right. Please, um, is that too loud or it's echoing to me? Maybe turn it down just a tad. Um, please get a handout for today. We are going to be in one of the, I think, one of the great chapters in the Old Testament for the next couple weeks, half of it today and half of it next week, Daniel chapter 3. And uh, I pray that we'll just be so encouraged by seeing God and uh, the faith of these three young men in the midst of this very dark and antagonistic society against them. So should be a good time today. should be a very good time for us to reflect upon uh, what God does in the hearts of his people for his glory. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together and dive into Daniel chapter 3. Father, we... <clears throat> We have one desire this morning, truly, and it's to behold you, to see your glory and your majesty and your sovereignty and your power and your, the way you rule over your universe to fulfill your promises, your word. We're in the midst of a book where we see your plan set forth, the big picture with regard to nations and individuals as you are moving in all of history to enthrone the Lord Jesus Christ over the eternal kingdom that he will establish on this earth that will move into eternity into the new heavens and the new earth as he forever rules over that kingdom under you exercising all the power of God to the glory of your great name. I pray that we would see that those in the midst of this plan who know you and love you reflect the reality of your work in their hearts. No matter how dark the society gets, no matter how much the opposition is, they remain faithful to you. Not because they're able, but because you're a great God and you bring great, a great salvation to us. So help us to learn today and behold you and uh, learn, uh, learn how you are so great to keep us in the midst of our society as we see what happened to Daniel's three friends in their society. So Lord, bring the truth home to our hearts. Uh, if any have walked in here this morning and don't know you, May you bring them to yourself through the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring them, Lord God, uh, to salvation, we pray. And stir up the hearts of your people to be more like these young men that we will see today for the glory of your name as well. In Jesus' name we pray these things, Lord, today. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> This is, I'm sure this is a story that you all are from, very familiar with. I mean, when you're little, you get the great stories of the Bible, and one of them is the fiery furnace, you know, and it's like, whoa. And that's our chapter uh, this week and next week. So we want to learn and glean the great truths that God has for us to see in this chapter. So... Uh, in a sense, we move from a focus on Daniel uh, in chapter 3 to a focus on his three friends and their faith demonstrated in the midst of a life-threatening situation. Uh, we're going to have the privilege once again of seeing God set himself on display. See, that's the key. The whole key to everything is that God is jealous over manifesting the beauty, majesty, and glory of his great name in the midst of a spiritual battle against the enemy. And he does it through his people. He does it through his people. Through the faithfulness of his devoted servants, 
who are willing to die rather than dishonor the God they love and serve. This is what it's all about. In Daniel 3, 1 through 18, this first part of the chapter, we have King Nebuchadnezzar building an immense golden statue before which he demands that all those that have significant positions of authority in his kingdom bow down before it and worship. The penalty for not doing so was immediate execution by being thrown into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. That's 3, 1 through 7. When Daniel's three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to do so, they are vehemently accused and slandered by their opponents as they bring charges against them before the king for not following the king's command to bow down before the statue and do homage and worship. We'll see that in verses 8 through 12. And then the result of the accusations was that the three young Jews faced the king's, it says, fierce anger and wrath as he interrogates them, to which they respond with marvelous courage and faith, trusting in their God's faithfulness, power, and ability to save them. But regardless of what their God would choose to do with them, they would not bow to the king's image. Folks, they're a timeless timeless example for us of genuine faith. Genuine faith. Flowing from hearts changed by the grace of God. See, we're going to see this isn't... (laughs) This is not about them having the strength and the ability to do this. It's about God manifesting his glory and majesty and power through his servants whom he sustains in the midst of this kind of trial. So let's, let's just dive in there. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I want you to, as we go through uh, the implications, uh, if we have time, Lord willing, at the end, uh, I have an implication discussion, and um, when I was a young man growing up in the church I grew up in under the Word, the pastor, uh, Pastor Joe, who was a marvelous exegete and teacher, uh, told us in our men's study, he said, men, when, when, every time you hit a text, he said, look for three things, and I still do this. So today, as we go through, look for three things. I want you to see what you learn about God himself, what, because we're going to see things about God we need to see. And then also, see what you learn about what it means to be a righteous person, a righteous person. And then also see what's going on in the lives and hearts of the unrighteous people in this text, the wicked. Okay, we want to learn from these things, and at the end, we're going to discuss that. Now, we'll bring some of it out, but we want to discuss it together at the end, Lord willing. Okay, three things. What do we learn about God? What do we see about a righteous man? And what do we see in contrast to that about the wicked? Because there's only two kinds of people in this room and in the world, righteous and wicked. And we're going to see it here, and we're going to see God. Nebuchadnezzar's decree demanding worship before the statue. This is uh, 3, 1 through 7. The making of the statue. King Nebuchadnezzar had a golden statue made. It was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. He erected it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, what, have, what had just has happened in chapter 2? with the king, his dream, right? And the interpretation of the dream by Daniel, right? And so you remember the dream, who he was in comparison to the other kingdoms. But anyway, it's not hard to see, I, I don't think it's hard to see, that the statue of gold made by Nebuchadnezzar is directly connected to the dream God gave the king and its interpretation by Daniel. 
Daniel declared that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. And he told him that the kingdom to follow his would be inferior to his. It was also made clear that the stone that would come and crush the statue, representing the internal kingdom of God, to be set up by the God of heaven, would be focused on the final kingdom to come, represented by the feet and the ten toes composed of iron and clay, right? He's getting the interpretation. So what would that, in, would that interpretation have been? What would that have done for the king? I, I, that's my next paragraph, you know. If you were afraid, and let's read it, the interpretation by Daniel alleviated the king's fear that the dream, because he didn't know what the dream was about. He just sees it. He knows it's about kingship. Alleviated his fear that the dream was about the imminent catastrophic destruction of his kingdom and rule, right? That's why he was so afraid and wanted to, wanted to know for certain what this dream meant. As a result of this, even though he was humble before the God of Daniel, right, there was no real change in him with respect to his self-centered exaltation and arrogance. In fact, in fact, I think Daniel's proclamation, you, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. That seems to have fanned the flames of his self-centered arrogance. He, has, he, he doesn't see anything about God in there. It's just about him. You're so great. You have the power. You have the authority. <clears throat> Without a true change of heart, he does what any absolute despot would do. I think riding a wave of egocentric pride then, he makes this statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. It's hard to know exactly what's going on. It may have not been just the statue. That may have included the statue with a stand or something, but it's still pretty, um, a pretty magnificent uh, structure. And it doesn't just have a head of gold. The entire statue is gold, probably gold-plated. That's how they used to do things, even when uh, they built the gold items for the tabernacle. Gold-plated, highlighting his sense of self-importance, right? And he created it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, his home province. Province. <laughs> Tanner states that he made it all of gold, suggests that this was an egotistical attempt to glorify himself, right? Himself. Whereby he took his God-given authority and turned it to exalting himself, insulting the God who had given him authority and who was to ultimately establish his own kingdom. You see? When men are blind, God does good things, whatever it may be. They don't see God. They just focus on themselves, focus on themselves and their own importance. And I think there's a, an implication. Don't we see that in many ways in our culture? Uh, when, when things really get bad, Life and death, what do people tend to do? Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, deliver me. Right? Doesn't matter who they are. They just... God, and, and then in God's wonderful grace, common grace often, God may deliver people from fear and hardship and humble them, but without a true heart change, they will 
very quickly forget his gracious deliverance, right? And continue on in their wicked ways. Isn't that the way it works? Whatever it may be. It's the way the human heart is apart from the grace of God. Grace of God. You remember, uh, same thing was true of Israel. Right? When they were delivered from Egypt. You remember? Exodus 14, 31, right? You know, they came out, delivered through the sea. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. Was it true heart change, though? And they believed in the Lord and in his servants Moses. But right away, after they get out of the sea, Exodus 15, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Right away, grumbling, complaining, griping. Not faith, trust. Exodus 16, continue on the journey, not far. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when, he sat, when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. What had they just seen God do? Without a heart change, though, it means nothing in terms of behavior or attitude or how you view God or worship or humble yourself before God. That's what's going on with Nebuchadnezzar. No heart change. He's the big guy. So now we're going to dedicate the statue, okay? Uh, this is great. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers, you get the point, of the provinces were assembled. They're all there now. Thousands and thousands of people, no doubt. It's a big kingdom. For the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the king, before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Um, so once this image is completed, the king plans this elaborate dedication ceremony. He sends word throughout the kingdom commanding that every person appointed to any position of responsibility from the greatest to highest position to the least be present for this ceremony. Now, these positions on page three, they're just, you know, Tanner gives you the descriptions. And it's, uh, you, you see, the top is the satraps, a Persian loan word, word which means protector of the realm. These were apparently the rulers over the primary provinces of the empire. Prefects, most likely, the prefects were high-ranking officials directly responsible to the satraps. The term may have had general meaning for one having jurisdiction over. And, and remember, Daniel was appointed to be the chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon, but it also said that he was going to rule the province of Babylon. So I think Daniel was probably a satrap as well as a prefect, because then his three friends were appointed to administrative positions over the province of Babylon. They would have been responsible to him. Does that make sense? So he's, he's at the top, I think. His friends are at the top of this. Then it goes governors, counselors, treasurers, magistrates, the police officers, you know, your police force. And then everybody else, in addition to the seven Specifically mentioned authoritative figures who were invited to the dedication. There were also these lesser figures, all the other provincial authorities. Uh, Tanner says it's like a gathering of the who's who of the land. And, and everybody else 
all the other peons would be watching to see how these people responded to what the king is demanding. Once assembled, they all stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This would have included Daniel's three friends. They would have been there. Now, the text does not tell us why Daniel's not there. Maybe you've wondered that. I've wondered that. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a word from the text about it. One scholar pointed out that the Talmud, the Jewish commentary on the word and teaching on the scriptures, said that, explains that God manipulated events so that Daniel would be out of the country during the fiery furnace episode in order to focus on Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the Jewish names, thus showing that they merited a miraculous de deliverance even without the help of Daniel. That, well, that's what the Talmud says. So it, we don't know, but he wasn't there. God spared him from this. So what's the king doing? You know, here, here, it's, his kingship is fairly new. He's had this dream, and so now I think he's solidifying his power and his authority with his underlings, right? Demanding absolute allegiance from those in his administration. There's kind of a paranoia about this, you know? People in power... They have a paranoia about maintaining that power and suppressing everybody else in one way or another. And I think the king is doing that. And by the way, this man had absolute authority to do what he wanted to do. So <clears throat> now we have this wonderful gathering. You know, a lot of fun is going to happen. No, because here's the decree. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, here, here we go, to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. Isn't that amazing? People, tribe, tongue, nations under this guy. There's another despot that's coming that God permits all the tribes and tongues and nations to worship, and that's the Antichrist. And this book is about the kingdoms that stand against God and his anointed Messiah and king right up to the end when he comes back. And so Nebuchadnezzar prefigures this coming worldwide ruler under Satan in the end. And you see it in this kind of terminology. O peoples, nations, and men of every language... That at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, I don't know what kind of sound that would make. We have to have Thomas tell us. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Whoa. <laughs> uh. So, let's think again. Page 4. The statue or image was not simply made by the king to be marveled at as a work of Babylonian art, right? The king in his blind passion... For self-exaltation, he now demands that all those assembled, when they hear the sound of the various instruments, all kinds of music, are to fall down in worship or pay homage to the golden image that he had set up. Uh, I, I think this is fair. Many scholars do not think that the king is demanding worship as a god, but that he is demanding homage that goes beyond the normal respect that was proper for him to receive as king. Because Daniel and his three friends did do that. You know, when you walk into this guy's presence, you do what you're supposed to do. When you walk into the presence of the President of the United States, there's protocol that's proper for the office. This is going beyond that. This is going beyond that. And, and we can see that uh, in Daniel... 3 verse 28. We're going to get there next week, but 
the bottom line is whatever the, he says, whatever the nuance of the meaning sigid in Aramaic worship has, it seems clear from the use of the same term in Daniel 3.28, okay, and we're going to get there, but listen to this, when Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship, there we go, any God except their own. So this is more than just protocol required to be in the presence of the king. He's going past that. And they understand that. They understand that. Because of what God has commanded them, back in Exodus chapter 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. They understand what's on the issue. So this then became a serious challenge to these young Hebrew men. The consequences for noncompliance, swift and deadly. Whoever does not fall down in worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Man, that's one way to motivate people. Isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's one way to motivate people. It's not you're going to participate in the wonderful banquet I have prepared for you to have fellowship with me as your king. No, you don't do this, you're going to be incinerated. Now, now here's just a cultural note about these furnaces. Furnaces for manufacturing bricks, kilns, have been used in Babylon, Babylonia, modern-day lower Iraq from ancient times. Kilns would have also been needed for smelting the ore, for the gold plating, as well as making lime. Uh, one man suggests, his ver suggestion is plausible, Tanner says, it may have been the furnace used to make the metal used in the giant image. This would explain its close proximity to the statue. The production of metals such as bronze would have required the conduction of some type of furnace to achieve the temperatures necessary to smelt the ore and produce liquid metal that could be cast into shapes. The thought of being cast into such a furnace would have been absolutely terrifying, people. Joyce Baldwin, another commentator, reports that the temperatures in these kilns could reach as high as 1,000 degrees centigrade. That's hot. That's hot. So, motivation. So, what's going on? Think about this. Who's in control of all these things? The God that these men worship. So, I think it's right now, God has now set the stage. God has set the stage for his three servants to honor his name through their faith and devotion to him. And in delivering them to exalt his name once again before a pagan proud king who will learn, we're going to see next chapter, who will learn he, this God, is able to humble those who walk in pride. He's able to do it. Right? Folks, it... There's a spiritual battle raging under the sovereign control of our God for His glory. Everything He does has one purpose, to set His name on display. And we have the privilege of being involved in that battle and being used up by Him 
whatever that may mean, to bring glory to his name in the midst of this battle. He, from nations to individuals, it's about that. You remember, um, when God crushed Egypt to deliver Israel from Egypt, right? There was a purpose to why he did what, to why he set everything up to deliver them from that nation in the way he did. Didn't have to do that, but here's why he did that. Then the Lord said to Moses, Exodus 9, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. I'm going to show the most powerful nation on earth who's really in control. It's not Pharaoh. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you have been cut off from the earth. So what's, why does he do what he's doing? To show and set forth his name that there's no other God like him. So he puts his people in circumstances where he uses them to show the world his power, his grace, his glory, and who he is right? And we're going to see how these men understand that and shine the light on who he is through their faith. Well, here we go. Now, if you're in this audience and you heard the proclamation, what's going to be on your heart? Blow it, baby. I'm going to kneel right away. (laughs) Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, bagpipe, all kinds of, all the people, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. There is not a moment of hesitation. Thousands of pagan subjects and servants of King Nebuchadnezzar gathered before the golden image are quick, and I would add, no doubt eager, (laughs) to comply with the king's command, given the added motivation of the dire consequences associated with the disobedience. Even if they didn't agree, (laughs) even if they didn't like this guy, man, that's pretty heavy-handed. Come on. Boom. I'm down. To a man. All the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And we're going to, you know, when you, as Revelation progresses and you get to the end and you see the kingdom of the Antichrist, in spite of seeing God judge the world, they bow the knee to this false Messiah and worship him to a man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they did, and and. Yeah. Well, some some not most theologians think it's not a statue of a god, but some think. It's Nebuchadnezzar's connection to Marduk that he's no, I promoting. Don't understand that. I'm just thinking, it's not even like they're worshiping Nebuchadnezzar, they're worshiping a statue. Yeah, that's the point. It goes beyond just bowing before the king as he comes and says, Here's the king, and everybody bows. This has to do with a worship that is inappropriate, that he's demanding, that they understand and that he admits later. Okay? So it's kind of a heavy-handed way of demanding this kind of allegiance from all of his people who are in control of all things. And I think it's also to show he has the power to just snuff you out if you don't obey, right? He has the power to do that. He, what kind of guy is this? He's a hard-hearted pagan 
It, 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 the phrase, you know, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. You can see that in this guy. There's nothing good about him in that sense. So, to a man, all bowed before the statue except three young Hebrew men. Three out of thousands. <laughs> can you imagine... And they're, they're at the top of the administration change, chain, and so when everybody bows, they're standing up. It's so obvious. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So they're accused of defying the king's order, verses 8 through 12. Um, For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. And in verses 9, 10, and 11... They remind the king of his decree. Okay, they remind him of his decree and what should happen uh, to those who do not. And in verse 12, they say, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They have not served your gods or worshipped the golden image which you have set up. Now, let's think about this a minute. You remember at the end of chapter 2, we have Daniel and his three faithful friends promoted by the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to the highest administrative positions of authority in his kingdom. Daniel was made ruler over the whole province. His three friends were appointed uh, to positions under him of administrators over the province of Babylon, it says, while Daniel was at the king's court. I don't think it's hard to imagine the envy and jealous hatred that those over whom these young Jewish men were promoted held toward them. I don't think we can understand that. But guess guess what? Like any natural man, they quickly forgot that it was Daniel and his friends that were responsible for delivering them from the king's rage against them, threatening to tear them limb from limb, and to make their houses a rubbish heap. How quickly we forget. They hated these foreigners who pleased the king, but had no regard for their gods or the demonic pagan arts and crafts that they practiced and were experts in. They were made to look like impotent and impotent and incompetent when their occult tactics could not help them identify the king's dream and interpretation. And no doubt, don't you think we're looking for a chance to get even with these guys? Right? It's the heart of the natural man. What, what else? They're just absolutely blind to the glory set on display through Daniel and his companions by the God of heaven. They're just blind to it can't see it, neither can the king, even though he was humbled. Now, this is interesting. Just uh, For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans, these would have been experts, priests in the Babylonian religion, came forward and brought charges against the Jews. We know, this is, you know, you might, th- you might think, well, They're just being faithful to their gods and trying to do what's right. No. We know that their motives were not about defending their religion in a non-malicious way because the meaning of the phrase, here we go, page six, brought charges, I'm sorry, brought charges. Tanner states, these Chaldeans, quote, brought malicious accusations against the Jews. This is a translation of a Semitic idiom, which literally means to eat their pieces. What a nice thought. This is sometimes translated denounce or slander, but maliciously accused reflects the sentiment accurately. Their attitude toward the Jews resembles, you remember Esther and Haman, you know, the hatred toward this people who don't Bow the knee to our gods. Hatred in that situation as well. So they repeat the command given by the king. 
Then they bring their charges, verse 12. First, they identify the guilty lawbreakers, certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely these three guys. Now, notice, this is interesting, just an observation. The, the names, of course, are their Babylonian names, which are associated with their Babylon, Babylon's gods, okay? And so here's the thought. I think this is fair. The use of their Babylonian names related to the Babylonian gods shows that no amount of cultural saturation into a pagan dark society could change their hearts and conform them to a pagan mindset. They tried everything they could to convert these guys. Did it work? No. And here's the evidence. Here's the evidence right here. Couldn't change them. Couldn't change them. You can almost hear their disgust and contempt as they point out the three men, but also highlight their race, certain Jews. They didn't have to say that. Just these three guys. Again, it's Haman's attitude in Esther. You can look it up 3.6 where he just wants to get rid of all of them, not just Haman. Hates them. And they heighten the tension by pointing out that the king himself had appointed these rebels you did, king. You appointed them to positions of authority. You graciously gave them their positions, and they have betrayed your trust. These are really bad dudes, king. They bring three charges. First, they say, these men, O king, have disregarded you. The net translation of the phrase is this way. These men have not shown proper respect to you, O king. Now, you, you, we remember the, what's happened in the book so far. Did Daniel and his three friends show proper respect for the king and those in authority over them? Yes. They were very respectful. They weren't rebellious in their attitudes or actions. So that's a false charge. The second and third charges were true. They don't serve your gods, and they don't pay homage to the golden statue you have erected. They make it personal with the king. Your gods, king. Not our gods, your gods. They don't serve your gods, king. They make it as personal as they can or pay hom homage to the statue you have erected. And, and you know what? Here's, here are these three men who love God. Israel was in exile because they violated what we read in Exodus 20. They worshiped false gods, and they're booted out of the land. These men love God, and they're committed to their covenant God with all their heart, so they are not going to do what the nation has done, because they, they love him. So now we get to this angry interrogation by Nebuchadnezzar. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, can you imagine having this man angry with you? You know, here's the furnace. This is not good. Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Ab Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready... At the sound you hear the music, at the time you hear the music, to fall down and worship the image I have made very well. But if not, consequences. So let's think. The very reason why King Nebuchadnezzar built the statue and ordered it to be worshipped was now being undermined by the three Jews he had appointed to the highest positions of administrative authority under Daniel in the province of Babylon, his home province, where the capital is, where he resided. This is not a small matter. This is a biggie. The actions of the three young men threaten Nebuchadnezzar himself, for by not serving the deities that sanction his rule, give him prosperity, protect his life, they denigrate the king's royal standing. The author, Daniel, shows that for Nebuchadnezzar, their refusal is not only a religious act, it is a thoroughly political one. 
Namely, they are disloyal to the state to do this. They're disloyal to me, the state. The king, expressing his rage and anger, gets right to the point. What he says, is it true that this is so? He, he doesn't wait for an answer. He doesn't give them a chance to respond. He, he just simply gives them an opportunity to deny the charges by obeying his command in his very presence. Let, let's, let's prove right or wrong what's going on here. You bow right now in my presence. If you're ready, and if you do it, he says, very well. If they had done it there, the situation would be over if they obeyed him. It'd be done. Done deal. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what, here's, here we go. This is where God is setting it up. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Isn't this great? God puts his people in circumstances where his name is going to be exalted through their situation. What God is there? The last statement that he says, what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands, it highlights the point that will set the glory of God, the God of heaven, on majestic display when he answers this question with omnipotent power when he delivers his servants. It's going to be magnificent. So here's the courage and faith of Daniel, Daniel's three friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. Sorry. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. He can, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Folks, here, here we go. This reply, I think, from these three young Jewish men is a high point in the Old Testament that defines what genuine faith in God looks like. And let me just say this. Only those in whom God works the miracle of a circumcised heart have such faith because it's directly related to and flows from a heart that loves him wholeheartedly with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength and manifests the obedience of faith. You can see that in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, right? Where we have the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart, Israel, you rebellious people and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live these men have that kind of heart from the beginning of the exile Daniel and his three friends made up their minds that they would not defile themselves by partaking the food of the king's food remember that and, and they found a creative way to deal with that and it was accepted and God let them go ahead and serve without violating his will or his word. But now there's no creative way to follow what the king demands. The line has been drawn in the sand. Now there's no other option. To obey their covenant God will, will, now will cost them their lives if the king has the ultimate power to take their lives. But they know that the king has no such power. Ultimately, they know that the king and all that he says and does is subject to their God, the God of heaven, the true and living God, their covenant God, Yahweh. He alone has the power of, over life and death. They know Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. They know that. Psalm 115.3, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So they respond by the grace of God with faith and courage, giving the king a great theological lesson. 
We do not need to give you an answer. And we know the text. The men answered by picking up on the king's proud statement at the end of verse 15, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? They make it clear that the God that they serve is able to deliver them out of his hand, but they're not being presumptuous about his sovereign purpose in this case. So they add, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, we're not going to bow down to you. It's, it's very hard. It's a hard text. But I think the point is they're trying to dovetail into think the way he puts it, what God can deliver you out of my... It's kind of a conditional statement up, in, up front, and most theologians think he's, their words are mirroring that. But I think the next... Um, I think Baldwin's statement on the top of page 9 is helpful. I, it's, it's, it's a tough statement, but I think she states that three men cast themselves on their God whom the king has defied. They do not doubt the power of their God to deliver them from the king's furnace, but they have no right to presume that he will do so. In other words, they're they're saying there is a God that can deliver us, and we trust him. But even if he does not, in this instance, deliver us, we're going to remain faithful to him. Yeah, I, I, I think at this point, they're just laying it out there. We're not going to bow down to you, king, even if you throw us in the furnace. They're making it clear where their lives and faith are anchored. I think this is an example of true faith in their covenant God. The men know without question that their God is able to deliver them, but if he chooses in accordance with his sovereign purpose to have them give up their lives for him, they're ready to do so, trusting in his good purpose. Is that fair? That's faith, people. Faith is not the way it's defined in some circles. If you don't have the faith, you don't have faith, you didn't get healed. This is true faith. I'm trusting my God I'm asking for this to be done, but if it isn't his will for it to be done, I'm not going to bow the knee to anything else. I trust him. Whether he takes my life, that's faith. That's faith. And here's, here's another good thought about Daniel, and then we're going to talk a little bit. They also know that death in a blazing fire is not the end. <laughs> Daniel and his friends had a sure hope and certain hope anchored in God's promises of this coming kingdom that Messiah is going to rule over and participating in it. How? Through resurrection. You can read the end of Daniel 12, 1 through 3, where it talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And Daniel himself is told that at the right time, he'll be resurrected to rise for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So they know even if they have thrown in the furnace, it's not the end. God's promises are going to be fulfilled. They're going to participate in those blessings by resurrection. King, you don't have any power to really hurt us. You can take our life, but you can't stop God from fulfilling his word and his promises. Isn't that our hope? Right? Right? Don't fear a man who can take your life. Fear God, who after he takes your life can throw your soul into eternal destruction or bring eternal blessing. Okay. A few minutes. Let's just talk a little bit. You have an implication discussion there. Remember I mentioned at the beginning. So let me ask you this. We'll We'll do as much as we can. What things do we learn about God from these 18 verses? What things do we learn about God? Just whatever you think. Throw it out. Faithful. Faithful. Okay, very good. Say again. Sovereign. Sovereign. Amen. Who's ruling over this madman who has absolute authority on the throne? Their God rules. Yes. Yeah, yeah, amen. He sets the stage and brings us into circumstances 
that require us to honor him by trusting him, whatever he may do. You remember that dear church at Smyrna where the Lord Christ, the risen exalted Christ tells them, Satan's going to cast you into prison. Some of you for 10 days, be faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. I'm going to use you up for my glory and show the world that you love me more than whether you're put to death by a pagan society. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Okay, sovereign, faithful. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Here are these young men in a pag- surrounded by a pagan society, but they love God. And they're bearing witness to that. Right? Regardless of everybody else. They're not going along with the crowd. It would have been so easy to bow the knee, but they didn't. Very good. Okay. What things do we learn about the righteous in this passage, the godly, those who know their God? What do we learn? Their faith overcame their fear. Right? It would be pretty scary right? They're, they're faithful. <sighs> Keep going. Uh, they, don't compromise, compromise on what they, believe. they don't compromise on what they believe, even if, what, what, are the, what are the consequences on compromising? Life? If they don't compromise, fiery furnace, right? This is, people, this is the way God's people are. They they aren't super saints. They just love God. They've been given a circumcised heart. They know their God. They trust their God. They fear their God. They're hoping in their God. They're delighting in their God. And they're obeying their God. It's a package deal. That's who we are. How much of the professing church do you think would stand up and not bow if this was on the table? How how many? How many? Or would they find a way to rationalize bowing the knee so that I can continue to minister maybe down the road or something? All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. To show the world, like the Smyrna church, that you love God more than your own life. Right? The saints in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 12, I think it's verse 11, overcome Satan by the the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony, not loving their own lives even unto death. That's who these guys are. Sweetie? Say again. Yeah. 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 That's what happens later with Daniel, with the lion's den. That's exactly right. These men, that's why the first charge was false. They did respect him. Okay, what do we learn? Oh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Humility. Yes. Yes, amen. uh, Amen. It's in his hands whether he delivers us or not. We're not going to bow. Amen. That's good. What do you learn about the way the wicked are? <laughs> we don't want to be, we want to be like that. What about these other people? What are the wicked like here? What's that? No fear of God. Who do they fear? King Nebuchadnezzar in a bad way. In a bad way. Okay. Yes. So they want to squelch 
Yes, good, good. They, they want to get rid of the righteous because it condemns their sinful lifestyle ultimately, right? Is that true today? Oh, man. Man, just was looking at an article how hate speech is now becoming official if you don't toe the line with LGBTQ teaching. What else about the wicked? Yes, sir. Yes, motivation, jealousy, selfishness, pride, arrogance, self-centeredness, self-absorbed, egotistical, everything about them. Very good. That's excellent. Is that, I mean, can you see the contrast in this society between the righteous young Hebrew men and the rest of the society? Dear people, that has to be true for us in our society. Not because it's law, but because you love the God they love, and you're not going to bow the knee to a society that hates him, and they're going to hate you because you love him. Right? Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that you do not change. We thank you for who you are, a faithful, covenant-keeping, sovereign God, and your sovereignty is directly related to your love for us. Lord Jesus, you love us and have released us from our sins by your shed blood. And one day, we are going to participate with unimaginable joy and delight in resurrected glory in the kingdom that you're bringing. We can't imagine that. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be like these young men, trusting in your word, your promises, regardless of what you do with our lives for your glory. Help us to be like them, we pray. Thank you for this time in your word. Dear Lord God, may we love you more deeply. Thank you for showing us your beauty in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.